I used to call him the super chief because there was a guy on the picture that we made together who called me the chief, which of course left room for him only to be called the super chief. And uh, I began to think of him as a, as a, as a, as a slow-moving freight train. He uh, was unmovable, immovable about the things that he believed in. They used to call him the Indian, you know. The guys like Charlie Feldman and Howard Hawks and those people, Wayne and, and those people that were of that generation that they'd say, well, uh, oh, well, don't fool around with the Indian because once we get the Indian there, he'll never... Why did they call him the Indian? Is he he's part Indian, eh? I, well... Well, you know, A Place in the Sun was a film that sort of knocked everybody out, and uh, there were so many things in A Place in the Sun that were, that were, uh, um, um, uh, revel that were, were not done up until the time. I remember in particular, for instance, uh, uh, a way that he shot some over-the-shoulder close-ups of Clift and Elizabeth uh, on a very, very long lens and getting this part of the body. It simply, I don't think, was done until George did it. It's been stolen by many directors since. And yet, his style of direction was never to intrude. You would never be aware of the director. He would never put the camera in strange, unexpected places that would bring to your consciousness uh, the person behind the camera. He worked in that way that only the very, very best, the Renoir, Weiler, Zinnemann, and, and uh, I would say that no one was more... Uh, a better example of, of not saying, I'm here too, than George Stevens. George Stevens was someone that took it upon himself from his position of power uh, among film directors to protect uh, the other directors and the medium itself. And, and uh, what, what things that spring to mind is that are, are the things that would be obviously economically uh, unfeasible in a, in a very, very expensive medium like doing lots of takes and so on. The fact that George did this uh, made it permissible for people who were less powerful to nudge into doing the same sort of thing that, they, that would seem seemingly be a waste of money in the long run, uh, even for those people who, who, who invest the money would would realize that 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 they'd get a greater return on their money by uh, by uh, doing things that would seemingly waste some of the money. His lawsuit on a place in the sun is a significant lawsuit. It's very significant about George himself because it had to do with the placement of commercials. It had to do with this whole matter of selling movies to television and the fact that the medium itself, that the form itself, was totally uh, polluted by the insertion of commercials and the breaking up of, of, of sequences of film. He was willing to go to court in a way that I don't think that anyone else was. George seemed to be the guy who would just take the responsibility of saying, well, I'm going to do that for the people who make film. I think that that was a significant part of his contribution. This passionate defense of his fellow filmmakers, uh, this passionate defense uh, of, of those people. And it was interesting that all those people came to his rescue when he was out of gas on The Greatest Story Ever Told. David Lean came and Freddie Zinnemann came. All those people came and shot second unit for him on this uh, huge, huge film. You get to these moments in making films with impossible uh, obstacles and costs uh, and, 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 and they're moments of uh, just uh, tremendous frustration and you can say, well, how can, this, uh, how can this near art form ever become an art form with this kind of baloney that we all have to cut through? And, and you say to yourself, wait a minute, has, has, hasn't anybody ever made this fight on this issue, whatever the issue is? And you look back, and it was always George Stevens that at some time had made the fight. He had a way of making you feel better about your own fears of mediocrity about yourself. And I remember his talking about um, the way he felt <clears throat> when he got up in the morning and he was making a movie. He'd say he'd get up at about 7 or so or 8 o'clock, and he'd feel 
that he really didn't have a right to make movies. He didn't really have any energy. He didn't want to go to the studio. He didn't, there was nothing really much that he could think of to do, and he wondered why he would be paid. And he would go over there, and about 8 or 9 o'clock, he would drink some coffee and try to get some ideas, and, and it really nothing would much would come to him. About 10 o'clock, he would begin to talk to people, you know, and about 10, 30, or 11, he'd get what possibly might be the germ of an idea. Meanwhile, he'd be shoot, shooting some coverage that really didn't matter. So by about 11, 11.30, it would be lit. About 12 o'clock, they'd have it rehearsed, and about 12.30, or one o'clock, they'd re be ready to do it, but they'd have to break for lunch because uh, the crew and so on. And by the time they came back from lunch, it'd be about 1.30, and then people would be about late. It'd be about a quarter to two, and they'd try to re-gear themselves for what had happened before lunch. They couldn't really remember it. By this time, he was beginning to feel a slight amount of confidence in himself that maybe he could get a scene on film. It wouldn't be very good, but he could get a, a scene. And then about 3 o'clock or 3.30, he would have that scene rehearsed, and uh, by about maybe 4 o'clock or 4.30, that uh, he'd get one good shot, maybe a master on the scene, and that he'd be just about lit for the, for the, for the closer shots that had to match the master and that have to go <laughs> home. <laughs> and then he would say that he would get up the next morning and it would be the same thing. I think he was one of the best comedy directors that was around. His, his comedy was uh, uh, not obvious. It sneaked up on you. It was a kind of comedy that was a bleak. I, I hated to see him leave comedy for the other stuff that came out later on, for the, for the more, more serious stuff. Um, because... Uh, and, and, and nobody can do comedy quite like he, he, he was doing it. I can't begin to tell you how important George's work was in the war. Working for Eisenhower and his staff, really, all the time. He was kind of the big cheese of, of photography in, during, the war, during the war in Europe and certainly after the war. And particularly the films that he took of Dachau and uh, these unbelievable films of these ovens and these great big piles of bones that nobody could believe that existed. Most of that film that you see about the uh, six million Jews that were killed or burned or uh, put in the ovens came from uh, uh, George Stevens and his crew. Now, when he came back, he came up with an idea to make a director's company just directors who made their own pictures, individual directors who make their own pictures, nobody else. So we organized Liberty Films. I was in it, and uh, Willie Wilder was in it, and so the three of us became Liberty Films, we tried to make uh, pictures like the big companies. None of us, of course, were too familiar with administrative propositions. George Stevens' first film was uh, I Remember Mama, the edge had gone off the humor. He had seen too much. So that his pictures from uh, that time on were not comedies. They were serious. They were good. They were serious. When I die and I uh, happen to be anywhere near that place that's supposed to be the place to go, I'm certainly going to look George up, and I'm going to look a couple of other people up, and um, and we're going to go on from where we left off. And um, I think we'll start another Liberty Films up there, and wouldn't it be wonderful if we can, if we can make pictures in heaven that we can send down here? And by maybe by that time, you know that the the, the uh, then we just should, we'll have the machine enough to do it, that we will be able to do it. And when it comes down to do it, I want to do it with George Stevens. <laughs> and no distribution, not charges on those pictures, no. <laughs> you know, if you could put a man in three words, I'd say 
honor, talent, courtesy. To me, those three were the outstanding ingredients of George. I liked George's work because he was a stylist. Style is the expression of the whole nature of a filmmaker, in this case, a director. And I think no matter how you put it, uh, films for a director are always autobiographical. You don't have the same work. You see his films, and through it all, you see who George Stevens was. With a stylized filmmaker, you see it from a more poetic point of view. It's, it's a life elevated, a step up, and thereby becoming even more convincing than realism would be. I remember, even now, the battle scenes in Gunga Ding. They were all choreographed. And, and interestingly enough, which is very unusual, there was a great sense of humor in it. So you had a kind of an editorial comment under what was going on, and, and you enjoyed the orchestration of these crowds. The camera eye was very poetical and expressive with George. If you take Shane, for instance, every shot conveyed much more than the eye saw. There is a kind of a wonderful way of making the invisible visible. In the life that we live today, when most of the things you see on the screen are smaller than life, they're not even like life, you need something that is bigger than life, nobler than life, and something that inspires you. I feel the, the uh, judgment on a film is if a person who sees it leaves the theater a little better person than he was when he walked in. Now, he may be better for a couple of days or a week or two, sometimes even longer, but that should be the, the uplift should be it. Uh, now, when you see a giant, and you have those figures are bigger than life. There's a nobility, there's strength, there's power in them. And you walk out and you say, my goodness, I am proud to be a human being, rather than saying, isn't it a shame I'm a human being? What could I do about it? You know? When the interest and the emphasis is put on human characters, on human dilemmas, and how to solve them, or human aspirations, those films will live forever, at least as long as the celluloid lasts. And this is what George was concerned with. And this was the strongest thing that came to you from the screen when he was at it. He looked very much like, like, like an Indian chief. And we used to, I was, used to refer to him, he had this stoic, sort of, and uh, sort of, I, he couldn't talk suddenly, he wouldn't talk. There was a remoteness that I was, I was always referred to as his Indian look. I mean, he'd sit there and listen, and you could go mad trying to convince him of something, because when you are working, as a writer or as a producer, as I did with George, and trying to get a reaction from him. Is he like it? Is he not like it? Is he going for it? Is he not going for it? You know very well that a curtain could come down, and he would be listening. But you had no way of knowing how he was listening. Just as that he was listening. But above all, I think he had the capability of absorbing almost everything he heard. He was remarkably funny in very sudden ways. He'd suddenly say something terribly funny and very deadpan. He had a great sense of sarcasm. I would not like to have been on the other end of it. He worked very hard on his screenplays with the writers. Uh, he was very sure of his content. And the whole process of shooting the film, I think, was to George 
a process of accumulating the photographed materials and performances from which he would then make his film. That is why uh, he, has a, he had a reputation, and I thought uh, a malign one, because I, I, I knew why. Uh, my God, he got, Steve goes to Steve's again, he goes, I want every angle. Master shot, full shot, a medium full shot, medium over the shoulders, individuals. And then when the film was over, he had his film, he was alone, and he was now going to put it together. And this was a lengthy process, but uh, I think that coming to conclusions was for George a lengthy process, at any rate, a careful process, and I think making a film is the same thing. I had a feeling of George's tremendous adeptness, which he was never giving credit for the little things. How many thousands of feet of cat do you suppose existed? The patience, the incredible patience of shooting that bloody cat and the use of the cat. I would think that an executive had every right to sit there at night and see hundreds upon hundreds of feet of a cat and saying, what does this man want of this cat? Well, he may have wanted that cat to do some particular non-cat thing at some moment. And he wasn't about to tell the cat what it was. But the, and the cat didn't know what it was, but eventually he did it. And that's what George was waiting for. Place in the Sun was done right before I met George, and I remember seeing that film and being devastated by it. Uh, it was different in many ways, I thought, than any film I had seen before coming out of Hollywood, and certainly different in style than a lot of other George Stevens films. Uh, the use of the close-up in that film, the use of these liquid dissolve on top of dissolve for the love scenes between Elizabeth Taylor and Montgomery Clift uh, is the quintessential height of bromantic filmmaking. And what he does in this one film is you go from Shelley Winters, who represents the dead reality of this boy's life, to Elizabeth Dale Taylor, who represents the unfulfilled romantic dream. And the compositions, Shelley in that uh, doctor's office when she's asking for an abortion, there is a sense of deadness with, with Shelley. And the scenes with Elizabeth Taylor are done in these extraordinary close-ups, the love scenes, which I think are probably, uh, I don't think there are better kiss scenes <laughs> in the history of film. It is hard to do a kissing scene because if lovers start to kiss too intensely and literally on screen, it can become embarrassing for the audience. Rather than becoming more intense, it gets literal and rather absurd. And what George did was the camera came in and did a lot of that work. So the camera came so close, and he was dealing with these two of the most beautiful faces, I think, in, in the world, that it just treasured those faces and made them almost become one. For a man of my era, Elizabeth Taylor was the romantic dream, and she became the romantic dream in that one film. And somewhere, I think it's really the start of her legend. The doctor's office in Place in the Sun is a scene that has probably been done time and again in the dramatic literature, whether it be films or stage or novels, and that is the girl going to a doctor's office asking for an abortion and pretending it's a friend. And what makes it definitive in that scene? There was the same kind of agony for her that I felt this morning watching Alice Adams, my agony for Catherine Hepburn making a fool of herself. The, the humiliation, the sense of degradation of that woman, and the compassion with which Stevens deals with it. 
Uh, I had seen Shelley before. I'd admired her in a, in a double life. But I had no idea she had that kind of dimension as an actress. It took her a long time, I felt, before she could live up to that film again. And that uh, has to do with, I feel, not looking for theatrical effects and going for truth. And an actor who can feel safe enough to sit back, not being worried about a souped-up rhythm, and be able to dredge up what she has to dredge up for that. And somewhere she did that in, in George Stevens' film in a way that she had never really done that up to that point. Uh, it's like a duel between that doctor and her, and it has a suspense of a duel because you know that that doctor knows long before that it is not a friend, that she's telling a lie, and you wait and you wait and you wait for the moment when she's going to break and say, it's not for a friend, it's for me. That is suspense, setting up uh, in, in, in a... People would not think of that as a Hitchcock suspense scene, but it is, and what makes for a dramatic scene is an audience expecting something to happen, not knowing how it's going to happen, if it's going to happen, or when it's going to happen. And he makes you wait to see when that's going to be. Once you realize it's going to happen, the more she goes on and fights telling the truth, the more suspenseful it gets. But that, again, is a, a director who knows what the theatrical qualities of a scene are, makes sure he gets it, but I'm sure he went for the truth with Shelley. Then in his camera angles, in the way he cuts that scene together and the rhythms he gets, he gets what he wants. That's... Uh, I'm sure that's the difference between a great director and an ordinary director. When I first saw that film, I thought Montgomery Clift had a strange deadness at times about him. That he lacked a kind of... At that point, I felt that there was not this passionate hunger that I associated with that boy. Now when I see it, I feel differently. It's a true alienated person in many ways. There was a remoteness about Monty in a, a Place in the Sun. And I now think back, and I feel the opposite. I think it's wonderful in the film. And that brings us to George and alienated people, or people who are on the outside. In, in many ways, I think that A Place in the Sun uh, represents uh, the end result of George's fascination with the outsider. Although you could say his last picture, the greatest story ever told, that deals with the greatest outsider in, in history. <laughs> But you go back to Alice Adams and you see that lonely girl at the party. You see that girl feeling different from everybody else. That girl who is so painful for us to watch because she is so desperate to succeed, to be a part of society over the world of the rich people in town. And George accomplishes something that is very difficult to accomplish. He embarrasses us with the character and he moves us with the character. And there is that part in all of us who's reached out to be something we're not that can relate to that character. If George uh, made embarrassing behavior moving in, in Alice Adams, which is a difficult thing to do, he made vulgarity <laughs> sympathetic and giant. He showed that mixture of vulgarity and generosity of a certain part of American society, of a certain nouveau riche part of American society, of a powerful part of American society, which, uh, and did it with a satiric eye, but with an affection, which is very, very tough to do. He also is wonderfully American in that he got a sense of the great outdoors and how great the great outdoors are. I mean, one of the great American images is that house in that endless, endless space it is an absurdity, that Victorian mansion in the middle of nowhere, and yet there is something daring, uh, misguided, outrageous, and courageous about the very attempt to stick it there and defy the fates. It touches on a very deep part of the American legend. His rhythm and comedy was remarkable, and it's the opposite of most of the rhythm and comedy that you see today, you see with directors today, or even a lot of directors then, because the average comedy is confused with cartoon and everybody goes fast. Speed on television, of course, is outrageous that way. Everything's wham, bam, slam cuts, fast cuts, and that's considered funny and juicy and lighthearted or something. And the remarkable thing is to watch George's camera standing there quietly while a woman like Catherine Hepburn, a woman of the year, is trying to cook 
her breakfast, her first meal to prove to Spencer Tracy she can be a woman in the conventional sense. And the beginning, middle, and an end, the end of that sequence, the architecture, and the time that George takes to set that scene up is just remarkable. He does at this leisurely pace, and the more desperate she gets, the more dignified the camera becomes, standing there very much like Tracy himself in the background, watching her without commenting on this foolishness. The contrast, the counterpoint of the camera and the frenetic quality of her action is brilliant, and you rarely see that kind of thing. It's much harder to excerpt. George Stevens' picture should be seen whole. I mean, the scenes have beginning, middles, and ends. It's daring because it takes a lot of daring and courage to take your time with comedy. But when it pays off, what you have is a reality of situation which makes the laughs deeper and richer and gives you a sense of recognition and of relating to the character that is uh, ideal. There is a laconic quality in George Stevens' pictures. There is a sense of the observer, of the person outside, whether it's a place in the sun, whether it's the more the merry, it's that camera as the observer. It is the antithesis of a certain kind of souped up theatrical film style that we have today, especially on television, and which is now permeating and at certain times poisoning theatrical films. Everything juiced up, but it's that laconic quality. You always feel you're seeing it through the director, this unknown quality. It's the quality that George had as a man, that big, quiet man just sitting there or standing there, sometimes like a great stone statue, watching, observing. And his films have that laconic quality. And no matter how much he will use uh, complicated dissolves at the end of a place in the sun while Montgomery Clift is walking off to his death with the, the dissolves coming over, him kissing Elizabeth Taylor, there is still that sense of always being one step, one step back. And it's a remarkable quality. It's, uh, it's a quality of control. I always feel you know you're safe because you know there's somebody controlling what you're seeing and who knows what he's doing. And it is a mark of the greatest kind of confidence of a director because it means that he, that he feels the truth of what he's done is strong enough to stay there by itself and, and to be observed and not to use the camera to juice everything up, not to use cutting to juice everything up for theatrical effects, for emotional effects. It uh, is even more remarkable today than it was then because we've gotten so far away from it. And it's the most courageous kind of filmmaking to me. There's a body of work that I think is in the core of the American tradition of filmmaking. And I, I think uh, there are a few directors who've added to the motion picture vocabulary. I mean, Hitchcock is obvious in a way. But George Stevens is certainly one of them. He stylized use of sound effects long before Citizen Kane. His use of every aspect of the medium, his use of cutting, his use of the close-up is ex extraordinary and will stay. But beyond that, there is a humanity in his work, whether it be drama or adventure or comedy or melodrama, that uh, is remarkable. And that's what represents the best part of American film to me. He talked about design. A lot of people understood his design as art direction, or production design. What he thought about design, or he, what he, he conceived by that, was the real um, heart or core of the picture, which is something to do with structure. Structures, uh, uh, literary structure, dramatic structure, which also in his own mind he translated into a visual structure. The, uh, he talked about that many times and, 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 and defined that as a very thin veil, you know, or, a, something, or, or, or a thread, something that is very tenuous and very strong at the same time, like silk. And that's what he was looking for in a film. I think it was always insecure about a project till he found that particular core 
and once he found it, he never changed from it. He was possibly one of the most uh, organized and planned men in, in terms of planning the film from the point of view of structure. Even though, at least at the time when I met him and I worked with him, his work on the set was always improvisation. He always improvised. I asked him many times, I said, you know, why don't you think, don't you ever think about camera angles or anything like that before you go on the set? Never, he said. Otherwise, when I get there, I get bored. I remember sometimes when we were writing on the screenplay, uh, thinking about scenes, he'd uh, begin to concentrate and begin to dictate the scenes. And his concentration was so enormous that his lips would dry up. And he kept on just dictating the scenes. And most often, that's the way they hit the screen. The same thing he did on the set. He'd start anew, coming back from the very beginning, concentrating again, trying to forget that he has something to do with the screenwriting and let the scene grow from there. The same thing he did in the editing, of course. Always starting again, starting again, starting again. He shoots a lot of film, but not many takes on the same camera angle. He shoots a lot of angles. And uh, this goes to, to the fact that a lot of people said it is very slow in shooting. I've seen George Stephen do 29 setups in half an hour. In the great story of Atoll, there is the scene of the, of the uh, Lord's Prayer where it was all set up to be in a certain place at sunrise. So the whole thing was coordinated with two cameras, and there were 29 setups done in half an hour. He told me at one time that he had done as many as 110 setups in one day, just to prove a point. In the great story of I told, we had um, 500 and 56,000 feet of 35 millimeter film. And I remember on one scene there were eight takes and that was because of a camera move and the camera operator and the assistant kept on asking for more assurance having to do with the focus. Then there was one other scene with Max that had four takes and uh, the rest of it was two takes. So you can imagine the amount of work and camera angles this man photographed. It's very difficult to sum up. He's a very complex man. I think he was uh, extremely interested in investigating human nature, including uh, the dark side of human nature, which he recognized uh, in himself a great deal of. The figure of the place in the sun, for instance, George Eastman, is very much himself, I'm sure. Very American story, the American dream. Story cannot be conceived anywhere else except in this country. And um, a person who is brought by this dream to do things that he wouldn't do. Uh, the excesses. The other figure in Giant, same thing. Prejudiced man who behaves in the manner that he does, and all of a sudden he finds himself confronted with the Mexican kid in his own family, you know? That is what uh, was, uh, I think, the, uh, his deep investigation, the fascination with guns, and at the same time, the abhorrence of it. I think he um, wished that the one time that he had been a general, I'm sure, and, and do the wars and be up there with plumes and other things, and have the glory of a military career. He would have been very good at it, I'm sure. At the same time, he saw that people got killed by war. And uh, the thing that may uh, drive Napoleon to great success also leaves behind that kind of a figure and an extraordinary holocaust of mankind. So he, I think he, he caught the, this, this, this dream, desires within himself, and I think he investigated them through his work. I think that he, uh, he wanted to be particularly compassionate. I think he would have liked to be known as a compassionate man. And I think he was a very compassionate man. He was attracted by stories that had to do with compassion. At the same time, he knew that he himself occasionally was not compassionate. 
either towards himself, or towards his colleagues and other things. So that, that was his interest in life. He was just starting as a feature director when I started in the business. So he, he, I had known about George Stevens, but I think he'd only really done, uh, done uh, shorts up to that time. I started in 1933, and I think he was doing at that time, or I just finished or about to do, a Wheeler and Woolsey comedy. It was only when he did Alice Adams, which is, it was his first kind of major AA feature starring Catherine Hepburn, that he came on to the fore as a, as a major filmmaker. I did some work as a uh, sound effects and music editor. I know we were working down in the apartment, and we got a message one, uh, one afternoon, I think, that Mr. Stevens wanted to have a sneak preview the next night. Uh, boom, like that. And he was a very determined man, even in those days. And uh, I remember working uh, all afternoon, all night through, and getting a temp music score put in. A lot of other people were working on the sound effects. In those days, you see, these, these were optical tracks and uh, not the tapes that you can cut right back and have immediately. So we had to get all those through the last one. We made the preview for the next night. <laughs> that was one of my first memories of, of uh, working with George and, and how we worked and, uh, and his insistence on, the, on things when he wanted it that way. This was George's uh, uh, big break. Hepburn had actually asked for him, so he was uh, her choice. But there came a point someplace in the picture, and I can't tell you just what scene it was, where they had uh, completely divergent uh, ideas and concepts of how the scene should be played. And uh, Miss Hepburn uh, didn't want to do it George's way, and he just would not have it any way except his way. And he just insisted and refused to budge and wouldn't give in. And finally, as I understand it, it was done pretty much, if not entirely, Mr. Stephen's way. He just held his line and said, that is it. Well, I think particularly under the circumstances when she was the one who had selected him to do the film, be the director, and since it was his first opportunity, I, I think it just, it, it just uh, underscores the man's uh, uh, integrity and belief in his own feelings and in his talent and, and what he was doing and his determination. And uh, I think many, many uh, directors in similar circumstances uh, would have bowed, uh, hopefully gracefully, and, and gone the other way, uh, but not George. I remember stories that they would get just reel after reel after reel after reel of film now from, from Lone Pine. You know, would suffer the elephants that would say, oh, they, can't, they, they couldn't imagine he could be shooting any more on that. And the next day they'd get another five or six reels on the sequence. And they were, they were laughing and kind of going out of their minds a bit. Uh, George, as you probably know, had always been dedicated to shooting a lot of film and getting a tremendous amount of coverage. And I think in, in Gunga Din, he, he, he went to uh, the, the ultimate almost in that from all the reports. But he turned out a fine film when they finally, when they finally got him down off the mountain. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody all along the line that was running RKO, and I'm sure the other studios like Columbia, really had any success in, in uh, changing his pattern of work. Let's put it that way. I remember one incident I heard about and I don't know what uh, picture it was George was, was shooting at the time. And it was going slowly and getting behind. And they were trying to push for economy around the studio. It was one of those tight times. And nobody seemed to be able to get Mr. Stevens to speed up. So finally, uh, Mr. Rathlin, the head of the company, uh, requested that Mr. Stevens come up to his big office at the administration building and see him one morning. So George stopped work and, uh, and uh, came up to the office and... Uh, Ratham started to give him all the reasons why it was necessary for him to speed up, that he must push along, that they were getting way, way behind, and the budget was growing like leaps and bounds. Uh, Mr. Stevens, all the time, while Mr. Ratham was talking, uh, was standing at a window that looked out over the courtyard there below at the center of Arkale Studios, and listening, supposedly, or seemingly, to Mr. Ratham go on and carry on about this, uh, nodding his head uh, slightly and not saying anything. Finally, when Rathman was finished, Steve was turned, looked at him, nodded, walked out the door, went back to the set, and went right on shooting just the same pace, the same way that he always had been and always will. <laughs> just had no effect on him at all. <laughs> well, he was one of the strongest supporters of the director's position in the business, and therefore of the director's guild. 
George was not one of the founding members, I don't believe, but he was very, one of the very early members. But I don't think all through the years there was anybody, uh, a member of the Guild, founder or, or no, who believed any more strongly or as strongly as George in, in film as an art and the director's key position in that as the creative artist involved in, in, in making the film. He always had considered, does, did consider that uh, film uh, uh, was so important. It was the, the real 20th century art form, the newest art form, and he always considered it that, and he felt very strongly that it should be thought of that way and was a backer for any kind of organization that would further the knowledge of and the teaching of film as an art. I think that, that, was, that was really where it was with him more than anything else. I think that was the one, one big passion in his life was, was for film, filmmaking, filmmakers, and better, better films, hopefully. The thing about George that was most important to me was that he was one of the two or three people who could stand up against the front office, which in those days was quite unheard of because the front office was king. And if you rebelled against him, it was a very dangerous proposition. For people of my generation, this was probably the most important thing that could have happened because it became a formative thing. And all of us learned from that that you could, in fact, have some measure of success if you didn't give up. That probably was, in addition to wonderful films that he made, that George made, and the great director he was, but beyond all of that was the, his importance of uh, facing the front office successfully. He was a tremendous force in the Guild. He was one of the founding fathers, but beyond that, uh, the weight of his personality uh, was enormous and made it contributed enormously to making the Guild what it became in, in that he was regarded with the utmost respect by our opponents, the producers and the studios. And being a highly successful director, they couldn't just uh, shrug it away. They had to really listen to him and take seriously what he said. He had plenty to say, particularly on the creative rights of the filmmakers. Before the Guild existed, films were regarded as merchandise and studios made 52 films a year, one film a week to be released. After it had played for a week or two, it was then either scrapped or junk, but nobody took it seriously as a creative uh, medium. It was simply entertainment and merchandise. George was one of the people who instilled the idea and it was quite an uphill job that there was more to film than just that. And there were, in fact, some films that could be classified as very important contributions to the life of the country. Well, there were three or four that we looked on as supreme masterpieces. Uh, one, one of them, which was the time when I got to know him first, was uh, Place in the Sun which is one of the great pictures as far as I'm concerned. And it was a quality, first of all, in the way he portrayed human beings, but a kind of truthfulness that was very hard to find in many other people's work. He, he gave the characters a kind of weight and a kind of reality and a sort of compassion that was almost unique. A compassion perhaps being the most important of all. You, you couldn't think of Montgomery Clift as a villain or heavy and one, one felt very, very sad for him. And that was a quality, that quality of compassion is that plus the quality of humor he had was almost unique, I thought. Well, I did, there was the legend that George in some way, some people said he had some Cherokee blood which nobody really knew, but there was discussions about it. Because once in a while, he looked impassive. He looked as though he'd been hewn out of granite. And uh, 
his expression was very hard to fathom, just like an Indian. And he had eyes that looked at you with an expression of sadness, basically, until you saw the glint that was behind the sadness. And he never talked very much unless he had something to say. And you could meditate on what he said for quite a while. 